Hello and welcome to the special CNBC Africa broadcast courtesy of NBC. My name is Nozi Pombanjwa and we're coming to you live from Vintuk in Namibia. We're at the Invest in Namibia International Conference and of course over the next hour my panelists will be surfacing and exploring, discussing and debating emerging opportunities as well as challenges that shape the investment landscape in Namibia. It gives me great pleasure at this moment to introduce my panelists. We are joined by the Right Honourable Prime Minister of Namibia, Mrs. Sarah Kungungwela Amadilla. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. We're also joined by the former Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa, Dr. Carlos Lopez. We are joined by the Minister of Economy, Science and Digital Econ Society of the Federal German uh, Free State of Turington, of the Honorable Wolfgang Tiffensey. And last but certainly not least, we are joined by the President of the Namibian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, also known as the NCCI, Mr. Sven Thiem. My panelists, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I'm going to start off the conversation by taking a step back and giving us an opportunity to reflect on the theme this morning. The theme of the conference, promoting investment for industrialization and inclusive growth. And as you make your opening remark or statement, perhaps you may share your insights on the low-hanging opportunities, the partnerships that you think we need to cement, but more importantly, what do you think we're going to have to do differently to change the way we're doing business to accelerate international as well as domestic investment into Namibia. I'll start with you, Honorable Prime Minister. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> and I would like to welcome my co-panelists here. Um, the President has amply indicated in his statement, first and foremost, um, the low-hanging fruits. Uh, we have achieved peace and, and stability. We have macroeconomic stability. Uh, we have a, an economy that is growing. Uh, we have a population that is very youthful and eager to learn. We are investing significantly in skills development. We have very good infrastructures, although that can still improve. We are members of a integration um, structures at, at SADAC uh, on the African continent and we have access to international markets and uh, we have laws that nurture partnerships between government and the private sector, uh, one of them being the public-private partnership uh, law that would soon be tabled in our parliament and would enable us to harness the resources and innovation of the private sector towards investment in especially public infrastructures and, and service delivery. And uh, investors that would locate in Namibia would still have the opportunity to enter larger global markets to which Namibia has gained access through international trade agreements. Uh, so these are the low hanging fruits. The opportunities we have also mentioned in the areas of infrastructures, um, public infrastructure development, uh, we are endowed with the natural resources and exploiting these resources and adding value to them is one of the sectors that we can invest in. We have some of the most beautiful environmental and tourist sceneries uh, in Namibia. So this is a sector that is very vibrant and uh, can offer lucrative returns uh, to investors. But also um, in, uh, uh, through public-private partnership, we are looking to cooperating with private sectors uh, through our state-owned enterprises uh, so that we can optimize benefits for both ourselves and, uh, and, and our investors. And the value addition uh, to mineral resources, to, to food products and agricultural products and fisheries products, and the list goes on. So Namibia is really um, a lucrative investment destination and it's ready to do business. Prime Minister, the list is quite, uh, is quite impressive and I'm, I'm quite certain it's not uh, an exhaustive list and much more will be unveiled through this conversation. And we'll come back to some of the issues that you've raised and explore where the opportunities are in particular 
particular, I'm already thinking about uh, your state-owned enterprises and how do we position them as a natural choice for investment. But let me come to uh, Dr. Lopez and give him an opportunity to weigh in on uh, the low-hanging opportunities, the partnerships that you think need to be cemented, and what you think needs to be done differently to accelerate investment. Well, it is known that 2015, 2016 is almost a perfect storm for most of Africa and Namibia is no exception. Drought, volatility of the currencies, uh, commodity prices going down, demand also going down. Uh, the fact that we have negative interest rates uh, influencing risk appetite and we can go on with the list and basically if we take into account all those factors, we can say that we are going through a very difficult time. But this is very short term and short sighted, I must add. Because if you look into the fundamentals of Africa, they are actually pretty resilient and they are pretty consistent. Let's just look into FDI. The trends are very clear. Southeast Asia is the only sub-region of Asia that beats Africa in terms of attractiveness right now. Also in terms of flows, what people don't realize is that last year capital investment in Africa was 128 billion, which is an absolute record for the continent despite this climate I just described. And part of the explanation is the fact that most of the infrastructure and manufacturing uh, new policies that have been put in place in the continent are attracting more foreign direct investment than natural resources. In fact, last year, manufacturing was 20 billion of foreign direct investment in the continent, whereas natural resources was just 7.4. So you can see the trend, which is for diversification, not just of the economies of the continent, but also of the type of investment that is being attracted to the continent. And I think those fundamentals are added uh, in many respects by the surge in our demographic profile, be it in terms of you know, just rising population, but also urbanization and youthness of that population with Africa becoming by 2040 the largest labor force in the world at a time where there are major difficulties sustaining labor costs in Asia, which is our number one competitor when it comes to the attractiveness for new manufacturing. Since we are talking about industrialization, it's also very important for people to realize that Africa already exports about 500 billion worth of manufactured goods every year. This is not known. People think that we are just exporting natural uh, resources and, uh, without any uh, value addition. That's not quite the situation anymore. And I think it's very important for us also to realize that if you look into the size of agriculture, and it's the case in Namibia, in relation to other sectors, including manufacturing sector, uh, it is very clear where the trend is. We are moving into industrialization, although not at the pace that we would like. So having a conference like this one is very important, not just to state the obvious that Namibia is an excellent destination for investment for all the reasons that have been very well presented by the president. I will add one more statistic that I came across this week, which is the Afrobarometer um, indication of satisfaction with democr the democratic uh, values in different countries in Africa. Guess who is number one? Namibia. So I think uh, those are pretty obvious, but we have to add a second layer, which is this complexity of trying to attract investment that is not just durable, but also is looking into the future of the continent and the future of Namibia. And that means making sure that it is about taking advantage of the industrialization opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Carlos Lopez. And of course, as we look at industrialization, we keep a firm eye 
on inclusivity uh, of that growth. And as we take the conversation forward, we will probe your insights on that. Uh, but perhaps let's also bring in the Honorable Minister Wolfgang Tiffensen, of course, acknowledging the special relationship between Germany and Namibia. And as you bring in your insights, uh, Honorable Minister, again, bringing that relationship to the forefront, what do you think needs to be done differently to ensure that the relationship extends broadly into Europe for Namibia and also broadly into the African continent for Germany? Thank you very much. Uh, please give me the chance before I ask uh, you, I answer uh, to your question uh, to say a very warm welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me, inviting my delegation to this uh, wonderful International Investment Conference. It's an honor, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I want to say some few words about our delegation, about the situation in the Free State of Thuringia, actually, and then I will ask uh, and answer. First of all, it's uh, my first time in Namibia. I've never been here. But as a former mayor of the city of Leipzig, uh, I created a sister city relationship between Leipzig and Addis. And uh, as a parliamentarian, I uh, went to east part of Africa. And uh, I am sure that there is a great opportunity to make such a win-win situation you spoke about, uh, Honorable President. But I want to say some words about the situation 26 years ago. Tomorrow is the 9th of November. The 9th of November in 89, the wall came down in Germany. The wall came down. I was born on the east side of Germany, behind the Iron C Curtain, without any possibility to go out, to say what I want, to read what I want, to speak on the street what, what I want, and then the wall came down. And I think it's very important to know, to remember, that after the reunification we have a very complicated situation in the east part of Germany, namely in Thuringia, where I come from. It's one of the 16 uh, states of, of Germany, located in the middle of Germany. It was a complete, completely different situation than today. The industrial sector declined. The unemployment rate was 25%. And we have to do a lot to develop this part of Germany. And we need help from West Germany, from Europe, and we have to do it by ourselves. And I, I can say it's a, a little bit the same situation for a country like Namibia to to influence, to develop the country with help from outside, but with our own power. And I'm, I'm sure you can do it like Germany, like the east part of Germany. And it's not a question, what can Africa learn from the EU? What can Namibia learn from Germany, from Thuringia? Or the other direction, what can we learn from Africa? No, we are partners on the same level. And we have to create concrete projects, build bridges between Namibia and Thuringia uh, to develop our both countries. That's the message I want to bring from Thuringia to this conference. And that's why I'm here with a delegation. There are CEOs from famous companies. They want to invest here. They want to cooperate. They need private public partnerships to invest, and that's the answer of your uh, question. And on the other hand side, members of my delegations are presidents of universities uh, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, famous uh, places in, in uh, Thuringia, Erfurt, 
Jena, Nothausen, and so on and so on. They are famous research institutes and they also want to cooperate with you to bring concrete projects on the field of research, of education, of science forward. And that's what we want to do. And our free state of Thuringia is very strong in industry. We can cooperate in the field of housing, construction, food, automotive, uh, of uh, optics, of chemical industries. We can build up infrastructure that means streets and uh, railway, uh, railways, railway lines and also IT in the name of my ministry is digital society and uh, we are very familiar, familiar with this uh, item and that's why let's cooperate, let's uh, define very concrete projects and I am sure we will be successful in working together. Honourable Minister, thank you for that contribution. And again, a very firm emphasis on uh, collaboration, equal partnerships, rallying behind projects that make sense for both markets and positioning public-private partnerships as one of the models that can be used to do exactly that. Um, I'd like to move on now to Mr. Tim, uh, the president of uh, the Namibian Chamber of Commerce. And as you reflect and share your insights, sir, perhaps you may also uh, give a bit of a weightage towards what is the Chamber wanting to see in terms of improving the ease of doing business in Namibia? What are the things that you think can be moved in that context that might allow for even further domestic and international investment? Yeah. Test. Hello? Does it work here? Yeah, please go yes. ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the Namibian government for, uh, f uh, for organizing this event. Um, secondly, I also um, can only say and share my appreciation for all the people that have come to, to Namibia um, showing interest in the development, as our president sa said, our house. So I thought you were going to ask me as well that, um, about what are we going to do differently. And uh, I think I would just like to add to that conversation. I think if you look at our country, where we've come from the last 26, we've done a lot different to many countries next to us and maybe across the world. Um, I think that uh, we can be very proud of and that's what we uh, have built on as business in Namibia. Um, we as the NCCI are working in a very close relationship with the government to see how we can improve the um, making or ease of business. And, uh, and again, that's another um, example of how we do things differently here, is that we're working very close. Um, we, have, we, we heard that the president has an open door policy, obviously only for the things he's mentioned. Um, <laughs> and, and that, that um, uh, fosters um, um, us in creating a great environment, and the same have, uh, applies to the ministers, where we've got a good relationship to really develop Namibia. So um, there are various aspects where we, as Namibia, um, have opportunity and 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 um, create this environment. Um, as I said, um, there are some um, there are various um, acts in the making. I'm also saying um, emphasis on making. Again, we are playing, uh, we want and are a significant partner to gov government to see how we can support um, these laws and acts. Um, so as, as that, um, I can only also say that we, and I can also speak for ourselves personally, we are a beneficiary of that environment. I think as the minister, uh, Prime Minister said, we've got various examples of value adding in our country, we have, um, 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 we, for example, we also import raw material and add value and export. So the environment that we already have created is very conducive to do business. And I think at the end of the day, if you ask someone 
would you put your personal money into this country? For me personally, I say yes, and we do. So that should be enough of a sign that we have an environment that fosters um, um, business. And again, also the question, what are the opportunities? I think the questions today are, are more, what opportunities can we create? I think if you look at the Middle East, they have created opportunities to um, then exploit them. And I think we are, as a, uh, as a country, we are open to everything, basically. Um, we have built an incredible house um, where, we, where we can be a gateway to the southern African market. And yes, we have some challenges, as been mentioned before. And I think business Namibia has also um, equally um, have declared war on poverty. And that's why you find many businesses that do not have only profit as a motive, but employment generation, carbon footprint um, um, visions to have in partnership with government to create this and foster this environment uh, further. So um, again, what, how are we going to make, how, do, how can we foster ease of business? I think the one key item I can share with you is that, um, that we have a partnership that we can um, discuss and um, de develop things with the government that will just provide that environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chen, and very clear here around the opportunities to develop new markets and, and then realize new revenue streams. And again, when, it, when we uh, place or layer the demographics uh, of the continent against that, I think you'll be able to give us uh, more depth on what those new markets and new revenue streams might look like. Honorable Prime Minister, I want to come back to one of um, the, the points that you listed in your initial insight. You spoke of state-owned enterprises as being positioned as ideal for investment. Let's perhaps talk a little bit about that, given the uh, socio-economic mandate, sometimes a heavy political mandate that state-owned enterprises often carry. What is the approach that the Namibian government is going to be using? And is it going to be within the context of public-private partnerships? How are we positioning state-owned enterprises? Yes, uh, indeed, public-private partnership is, is one way that we are going to optimize cooperation between uh, the state and in its intervention in the economy and the private sector. And beside the law that I referred to that is being finalized and would soon be presented in Parliament, we already have a number of projects that are being pursued uh, by government through state-owned enterprises with the cooperation of the private sector uh, on the basis of PPP. The Kudu Gas Project, for example, was structured to be a form of PPP where you have the power utility being NAMPOWER, uh, NAMCOR, uh, embracing private investors to exploit our Kudu Gas and generate power and, and distribute it. And there are a number of other examples in the telecommunication sector with the MTC, our mobile telecommunication uh, utility, for example, where we started it off as a joint venture between the government of Namibia and the government of Sweden, and uh, we now have the government participating through an SOE and uh, a private strategic partner. And uh, there are some uh, portion of the shares that we are looking to uh, having divested to uh, private investors to, to strengthen the partnership uh, with private sector. So uh, that for the main part would be the, the, the medium through which uh, cooperation with the private sector would be pursued. But also the, 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 the programs of government through public procurement are for the most part implemented uh, by, by private companies and uh, private companies also are participating through financing private programs. So we have a very large program of, of borrowing from the capital market in Namibia that would not only uh, promote investment by financial institutions but would also promote the development of our capital markets. I want us just before we move on uh, to, to Dr. Lopez to perhaps come back to the Harambe uh, Pro Prosperity Plan and in particular maybe take a step back and reflect on the global economic environment which we know is under pressure and the economic blueprints or development plans of many African markets are also under pressure, uh, South Africa being one of those examples. How are you now engaging uh, commercial capital? 
uh, for them to unlock uh, some of the funding that will certainly be required to hit the targets of, uh, that are within the Harambe Prosperity Plan. Given the tough environment, what are you going to be doing differently to get the funding in? Honourable Prime Minister, my apologies. That was, was for you as well. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, I didn't quite follow. I no, I, I'm very happy to, re to, to repeat it. Um, given the, the tough uh, global uh, economic environment, we're seeing that a lot of development plans are under pressure, where the growth that is, is expected isn't being hit. It's not something that is unique to Namibia. We've seen it in other markets, South Africa included. So how are you now going to be approaching commercial capital to ensure that you unlock the capital and the funding that certainly is required to hit the targets of Harambe? Yes, uh, as I have indicated, um, Namibia's development plan uh, look at ways to also develop our capital markets so that we can optimize, optimize the high savings level that we have managed to achieve in Namibia towards promoting an increased growth of investment in, in the country. And one way to do that is to do it in a way that does not exacerbate the, the debt situation of, of the government by harnessing the private sector participation through PPP, as I, uh, as I have um, indicated. And uh, we, we have a number of infrastructure projects that are lined up for implementation using the PPP. But we also think that the private sector on its own can participate um, to a greater extent than is the case now. And we are using public procurement, for example, to support that by sourcing locally produced good. We do give preference to locally manufactured good as part of our public procurement policy. We also have other policies that promote uh, infant industry protection so that if an industry was to locate here, they would be given protection from competition through imports within the rules of the, of the regional integration organization and the World Trade Organization, for example. So we, we are recognizing that as a government, our role really is to catalyze private sector investment to facilitate that and not to substitute for them. And uh, obviously, we believe that we can achieve a lot more if we can also develop our human capital to enable them to be more efficient and uh, promote business competitiveness. And that is why skills development and education continues to be a priority. And, and we'll certainly come to investing in people, a key, a key enabler of any invest, investment plan. Dr. Lopez, I want us to latch on uh, to what the Honorable Prime Minister has spoken about, uh, in particular on leveraging commercial capital. Now, if we look at uh, the large-scale economic infrastructure projects that are not only required in Namibia, but certainly in the region and other parts of the continent, how do we unlock more capital long-term uh, capital from international as well as continental investors in a way that we haven't been able to before. If we take the sustainable development goals into consideration, we know that the funding uh, deficit is far greater than the capital that is coming in. What do we need to do fundamentally different to see commercial capital flowing into large-scale economic infrastructure projects? Well, first we have to admit that uh, Namibia is doing its part in terms of infrastructure in investment. Um, and it's going actually to benefit not just Namibia, but the region. Uh, this is the case with some of the road projects, also uh, what is happening in Wolves Bay. So I think Namibia has done great in terms of improving if, if, if its infrastructure, including on telecoms. So. What it needs to be uh, achieved, you know, your challenge, is how to attract more capital. But before we go there, let's see whether there is already some money in Namibia that is not properly used for investment. But there is plenty of it. <laughs> it's the way the financial sector uh, is being lauded as being efficient uh, in Namibia has also contributed to an accumulation of quite significant amounts of capital that could be incentivized to be better invested in the country. Also, Namibia has a very stable situation on its institutional funds, like the pension funds. That needs to be much more tapped into for investment in the country. 
I think if you look into the pockets of money that already exist in Namibia, including the capitalization that is associated with the land discussion, because you know, we, we look into land more in terms of uh, ownership, but it's about capital, it's about how it is capitalized. And if it is liberated in a certain way through incentive policies, you can actually multiply the value of the land because it becomes available for possible unleashing investment. So I think Namibia already has a lot of money. And because we need to tap into that money first, there are a certain number of policies that have to be put in place. Namibia has an excellent macroeconomic management. Um, so the time is now for a bit of risk appetite in these areas, so it can incentivize some of the use of domestic resources. Then uh, we have the issue of debt, sovereign debt. Namibia is quite low, so I think it should be kept that way because it gives credence to the investments to come and it creates this um, very well-established view that Namibia is extremely stable when it comes to uh, financial indicators. And I think if you have done all of that, you could have easily expected uh, a flood of capital coming into the country. But size matters, not geographical size, but economic, economic size, population size. Namibia is relatively small. It has a big neighbor next door that is going into some trouble. I don't want to elaborate, but you know, <laughs> it, it, it is bringing some bad weather. And this is something that Namibia cannot do much about. Size matters also in terms of the attractiveness for scaled investments. Like for instance, you wouldn't believe that you know, in the top three countries in Africa that receive FDI, you have DRC. DRC is not you know, a jewel of ease of doing business. Neither is Ethiopia, that is number five. It's not a jewel of ease of doing business. It's very much the other way. Red tape, bureaucratic, tough. Why are investments going there? Size matters. So I think uh, you, you have to balance different elements. And if you are small in terms of econom economic uh, size, you have to do more than your peers. You have to go the extra mile. A uh, general electric uh, president for Africa once told me uh, about Nigeria. We were discussing investment. And they said, why is GE, General Electric is the number one investor from the US in Africa, why is GE so interested in Nigeria despite all the difficulties that you are facing? And he said, for Nigeria, we'll go all the way. For the others, they will have to come my way. <laughs> and you know, this is the issue of size. So you have to go the extra mile, you have to come the other way. And I think uh, Namibia has the right political incentives, has the right policy incentives to do the right things. You know, you need convergence of policies across the board. Government cannot be compartmentalized in different silos. You have to have convergence. Convergence is number one word to unleash the potential of Namibia and small economies. You can have all the attractiveness of the world, you can be quite pretty, but it's not enough to be pretty, you need also to be convincing. And the convincing part is the convergence of policies. If you have the Ministry of Education not in sync with the Ministry of Industrialization, not in sync with the ones that are in charge of the customs, not in sync with the ones that are in charge of the incentivizing from a macroeconomic point of view, we have a problem. We, there is a need for this convergence and countries that are capable of demonstrating that convergence are also very attractive Do for investment. Dr. Lopez, let me be a bit difficult. I, I, I really want to go back uh, to, to the earlier point that you raised around finding the balance between being heavily integrated, so you're seeing the free movement of people and goods and services and bad weather, and whilst at the same time also ensuring that you are creating sufficient buffers such that when your big neighbor next door does catch a cold, it doesn't necessarily translate into the flu for your own currency and other issues. 
Where is the balance? Have we seen a best practice example, even on the continent, where that balance has been struck and that this approach could be reviewed for the Namibian context? Well, uh, when we talk about regional integration in Africa, we're talking about trade mostly, and that integration of trade will benefit Namibia and every single country in Africa because it will create a very sizable market where we will have the potential of really taking advantage of conditions that right now we offer to very far away countries uh, without uh, us necessarily benefiting from. What happens with Namibia and bad weather uh, reaching Namibia is more related to the specific uh, arrangements that exist with the, the Southern Africa Customs Union. We are going to have uh, the executive uh, secretary of the union with us. And also, uh, you know, the fact that there is a peg of the Namibian dollar to the South African rand. So it's, it's more the monetary, the monetary part of the arrangement and the customs part of the arrangement that is affecting Namibia right now. But as I said, let's not take 2016, which is a very difficult year, as our reference point. Because if you look into the mega trends, they are in favor. And even this integration of SACO has brought a lot of advantages to Namibia, not right now, but that I hope is short term. And you know, we should not throw the baby with the bathwater. So let's keep the baby in the bathwater. Honorable Minister, I'd like to move on to you. And I really want to go back to the initial point you raised about looking at the potential around the increasingly youthful population. And of course, this presents a growing consumer market. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the tangible opportunities that this uh, represents, in particular as we're seeing uh, a very more highly mobile, um, also very tech savvy uh, and young population emerging. What does this mean for the opportunities, new market opportunities even, that could emerge from this demographic shift? I think that's uh, one of the interesting points to look at the young people. Africa is young, Namibia is young, younger than Europe. I think uh, Europe is a little bit older. Look at me. <laughs> and uh, Exactly, that's, uh, that's a field of consumers for us. Uh, we have to face, we have to give them the products, but we have to give them education, that's another point. And uh, let me say some words about uh, creating corporations in the field of use or uh, mobile phones and uh, other technologies. I think when we want to create a partnership, partnership on the same level, create bridges, build bridges between our both countries. We need two pillars. Mm -hmm. On one hand side, I think it's very important to open the mind in Germany, in Thuringia, for Africa. Not all the uh, in investors know that Africa is our neighbor. It's nearby. It's a continent with the best future. It's a very strong population, an unbelievable growth in GDP. The curves increasing in the economy with a wonderful infrastructure we can use with young and very engaged, uh, motivated people. And we have to open the mind in Germany much more. And then we say them, we tell them something about Africa, I will tell them about my trip. And then they come to Namibia, the center of Africa, and they see here is a very good place to invest. Here's a very good place to cooperate between universities. Please, that's one of the key issues. Education, research, science, to bring people together to, to make projects in these fields. 
And what they need, what we need is uh, a stable fundament, a stable framework of administration, an independent justice, uh, the, the rules uh, have to be concrete, have to be stable. We need um, a long-term vision and that's why I was uh, very happy to listen to your speech to see what are the ambitious goals for Namibia, what are the concrete steps to, to uh, come to the goal, to come to the end, to uh, solve these problems, to face these challenges. And that's why we have to speak to each other. Mm. And my uh, talks with my, uh, my uh, um, talks with the ambassador of Namibia in Germany were very, very fruitful. We, we said it could be interesting to cooperate on the field of construction and housing, not only, and I will present uh, a company uh, in, in half an hour, Polycare, with a wonderful and uh, very new technology to build houses, to solve a problem of houses, mm. of schools, if you want. And that's what I mean. We need open-minded, we need uh, information, we need stable frameworks, we need goals, we need uh, concrete projects, and then with the help of the young people, I think we can manage and solve the problems. So certainly it sounds like one of the key enablers of investment is actually getting cultural connection and a better understanding between markets. And so it will be interesting to see what are some of the tangible ways that this can be achieved. Uh, I want to come back uh, to Mr. Tien and, you know, for, for, to the large extent in uh, conferences of this nature, you will find that the audience uh, is made up of more than just big multinational players. You also have small and medium size and micro enterprises uh, that have a keen eye on the investment landscape. And so let's hear from the, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce once again. Where are the opportunities to see greater collaboration across borders, into the region, into the continent, into Europe and other markets, for small and medium-sized enterprises and not just uh, the big uh, multinationals? Uh, uh, Sven, let me give that question to you. Yeah, thank you. I think the, you know, these conferences are always interesting because um, the doctor was referring to that the Mimia has got lots of money and I was looking at the Minister of Finance, so I was wondering where he's hiding it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the second one is like, I don't think we necessarily can compete with Nigeria um, where size counts. I think to partly answer your question is, I think we are a country that is small, smart, and sexy. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, I think one, one of the, um, and speaking to that, um, it was not meant to be a joke, um, is that we have this um, opportunity of um, creating and meeting culture. I think we have something here, is we have the strength in diversity that makes us unique. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to be very flexible in uh, partnering with um, large organizations as well as small organizations. We are um, a country that um, takes the small enterprise SMEs and so forth very serious and also as the Prime Minister said, we have the um, acts like protection acts to allow infants to grow up um, before um, they can actually be on their own. Um, so for, for, for us as the chamber, it is um, uh, we believe that this landscape that we are co-creating in Namibia lends itself to accommodating all, not only big ones. Mm. And also I believe that um, the chamber and us as Namibians are, have an open mind where, um, to your question about opportunities, is um, everything's possible. And, uh, and somebody said, what are the low-hanging fruits? You know, the answer is per perhaps, uh, what, you, what do you want them to be? Mm. And thereby, I think we will open new, hori who, new horizons, new opportunities. And then 
as a gateway to southern Africa, I mean, look where we are. We have we have invested heavily into the airport, um, not the airport, the the harbour, of course, um, which is the beginning of um, being really a, a log logistical hub and being able to connect to the rest of Africa. We've started with upgrading the roads um, and hope um, people like GE are, are here too to help us with the railways. Um, so there is so many um, examples that I can probably uh, give you um, where these opportunities lie. lie. Um, equally the tourism, I think tourism is um, underrated. I think number one is the biggest employment generator um, and second biggest in contribution to the GDP. There are plenty of opportunities, especially for smaller enterprises and so forth. So um, if it wasn't limited to session, I, um, I could probably list quite a number of things that are possible here and why it is conducive to be here, invest into Namibia. And as I said before, yes, we have challenges. We are young, we learn, and we will improve whatever we need to to foster that environment to make sure everyone in this house has a future. Absolutely. Thank you very much once again. Honourable Prime Minister, I'm going to bring together two issues that might seem unrelated at first, but I think there, there is a convergence that's worth talking about. If we agree that there, is, there are proven benefits to uh, tapping into the female economy on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, picking up from what uh, His Excellency spoke about earlier today, uh, the new equitable economic empowerment framework, and we bring these two topics together, uh, what, what picture is emerging around investing in women in particular and how the female economy can, put, can also be mainstreamed into the broader economic blueprint and economic direction for Namibia? What does that currently look like? Yes, uh, indeed, as Comrade President has said, and it was also said by many other um, experts uh, before, the only sustainable growth is a one that is inclusive. Um, we cannot hope to achieve prosperity by leaving a sizable portion of our communities behind. Uh, and this is not only important for reasons of fairness and, and justice. It is also important because if you leave behind 50% of a population, it means you are not tapping into their talents and, and, and skills. And, and you are therefore denying the country the opportunity to benefit from their skills and talents. And you are restraining therefore the growth and development of the economy. So from that point of view, the Namibian government has adopted the gender uh, equity and equality policy and has enacted a law that would ensure that women are given the space to actively participate in economic activities in the country and the support that they need in order to to, to achieve that. And the range of support that is provided go from providing skills and training, ensuring that they are not restricted in getting access to education, they are assisted to start business, their products can find a place on the shelves, they participate in the governance uh, in the public sector and in private firms, uh, and, 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 and so forth, so that we all can prosper together. And also with regards to NIEF, it is the same principle. We are not saying here that we take the cake that we have and we just change the way that we distribute that cake amongst us. We are saying we want to grow the economy. If you look at NIEF, it actually has about eight pillars. And the pillar on ownership, uh, is only one of those eight. There are many other pillars, and uh, different role players would be expected to comply to the pillars as they relate to them. So that at the end of the day, NIEF actually seeks to optimize the growth of the Namibian economy. It seeks to address the vulnerability of the Namibian economy to external shocks by broadening the industrial base, for example. It seeks to promote the competitiveness of our economy by promoting skills development and research in addition to ensuring that we partner as Namibians and we pull our resources, intellectual and financial, to, towards achieving a higher growth of our economy. 
Thank you very much, Honorable Prime Minister. As we begin to wrap up this conversation, uh, Dr. Lopez, you, you started off talking about the resilient fundamentals that are really worth noting. Let's take that a step further and, and get your voice on, well, what are the key risk factors that could undermine those resilient fundamentals moving forward? Um, put simply, what are the red flags that we need to be clearly aware of so that uh, those resilient fundamentals actually deliver for a, a more inclusive growth and a more robust economy? Well, I would say three. Uh, first, uh, lack of regional integration will have tremendous uh, impact in everything that happens in Africa. And I think it's not just a matter of uh, us doing better. It's a matter of us being able to catch up. You know, we are latecomers when it comes to industrialization and a number of other areas. And the latecomers' advantage, uh, for a great extent, depends on regional integration in our case. The second element, of course, is governance. It's making sure that the governance is going to be uh, like Namibia, uh, that we are going to have uh, stability, that we are going to embrace diversity, and that we are going to be able to create institutions that are solid and do not depend on uh, the occupant of the day. And then finally, the third element is, of course, structural transformation of our economies. We can grow, but if we grow without quality, without restructuring the characteristics of our economic fundamentals, we are not going to go that far. We will continue to be dependent on commodity booms and busts, and this is exactly what we need to avoid. We need to go deeper into transforming the economies. You know, just this last week and the, the next two weeks, five investment conferences are being organized. I was invited to all of them. There's one in Angola, Guinea, Tunisia, Algeria, and the one in Namibia. Guess where I am? Dr. Lopez, thank you for that. And of course, Honorable, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, one of the key things, especially when you have a, a very saturated market where you have five conferences within the space of a, a week or two, um, the most important thing is that the conference doesn't become another talk shop. So let me put you on the spot. What are you going to be doing differently when you get back to Germany? What is the message that you're going to be crafting and disseminating about the, the opportunities in this market in particular? I visit only one <laughs> conference. This. Because it's a very important place, a very important conference, and that's why we decided to come here. And we decided we cannot cooperate with all of African countries. We decided to cooperate with Namibia because of uh, the same situation in inhabitants. We are 2.2 million inhabitants in Thuringia. And you, I think it's uh, a little bit the same. Similar. 2.5. Um, we decided to come here. And I visit Namibia because I want to tell the investors, the potential investors in Thuringia, what's going on here. I will tell them about this conference. Hundreds of investors, they want to bring the country forward. They're looking for cooperations between each other. They look for co cooperation in the international market and please investors in Thuringia, small and medium sized companies, look at Namibia, look at the infrastructure, the growth, the young population, look uh, at uh, the possibilities to work with univers universities, to create projects with them. And we will support you to come from Germany to Namibia. And I will invite you to come from Namibia to Germany, to Thuringia, to a conference, and to give an overview about that 
development here and I'm sure that will be a very big and a very strong bridge between our both countries. So we're in the business of building bridges. Uh, Honorable uh, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tiemer, as a final comment, um, again, what are you most excited about? Looking into uh, the outlook for the investment landscape in Namibia, what excites you most um, and where do you think uh, the, where do you think the, the future uh, goes in terms of ensuring that we are bedding down investment that we seek? Yeah, I'm um, very, obviously very excited about the, um, this, the investor, investor co conference and the outcome um, about it. Um, I also can uh, share with you, um, I know that, that not always politicians are believed, but I can tell you we from the business in Namibia uh, and you can see the um, examples uh, here in Namibia that we have where we are doing extremely well. So you, you can believe the politicians, what they say. So we can take you around, we can show you what we've done. Um, the opportunities are further in really, really seeing what we can do differently to attract. I think we need to bring thinking to everything. What is that that is going to attract people to come here? And I think investors have an opportunity to invest maybe in more than 200 countries. So we need to see how we attract here, and I think we're doing extremely well of doing that, and that's what I'm excited about, and especially also the energy side, I think we will find a great future for that, um, as well as the logistical infrastructure side. And of course, for us as Namibians, if you look outside, there's rain, and then people smile. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I could have said it better myself. One of the key phrases that have come out of this conversation, Namibia, small, smart, and sexy. And that's how we close the conversation this evening. Thank you so much for making the time to join us on CNBC Africa. I'm Nozi Pumbanjwa. Until next time, it's goodbye.